I think the music was very symbolic, just like us, very beautiful periods of great illumination followed by interruptions that are full of lullness and dullness. So it's everything is symbol. So um, I of course keep a lot of books on the table because I'm not sure which one I'll end up opening. It's a little difficult to speak about the supramental path for various reasons. One, because there is a basic problem of the human language. All language is, by its very nature, deficient in the sense that it's an attempt to communicate a state of consciousness. That's what Sri and the mother have done. It's not an intellectual exposition of a way. It's an expression of states of consciousness. All language is originally meant to be that. But over a period of time, because of the various twists and kings in human nature, language has lost that capacity to communicate we end up analyzing and overanalyzing words, phrases, half a phrase, sentences. And by the time we have analyzed, we have lost everything. Everybody knows that one of the greatest reasons why human beings quarrel is this great faculty of speech. It is meant to create harmony, but it ends up creating difficulties, precisely because each one puts in the speech a certain state of consciousness. But we don't receive that, we receive a meaning in the head. And our meaning communicates to us another state of consciousness. And when we analyze it, it becomes an endless uh, quarrel. I suppose that's what is meant in the Bible story where when people are trying to build the Tower of Babel, so devil doesn't know what to do, how to disturb this process. Because if they build the tower, they will reach very high. So it creates a confusion in the minds of the collectivity. The confusion is such that when one person speaks something, the other understands something very different. The result is at the end of it, everybody is fighting. <laughs> supposed to work together. This is a natural human difficulty. One has to go through it because there is no other way but to gradually grow. The second problem is that it's such a vast path Shurabindra has opened. In one of her earlier prayers, the mother says, in fact, this is the pure Vedantic truth. She says, uh, of course, she communicates something which she has received in one of her meditations. The divine, her own highest being, reveals to her, poor, sorrowful earth, lose not hope, lose not courage, something to this effect. And he says, each, each joy, each grief, all that you call as good and all that you call as ugly and all that you call as beautiful, all that you call as sorrow, all, all, each renewal of thy seasons, each pang of thy heart, each call, each aspiration leads thee towards me, who am endless peace, supreme beatitude. Now this is a very vast path, everything. It means this yoga, whether we like it or not, goes on all the time. That's why perhaps Sri once said something very interesting. What is the secret of this yoga? He says, stick on. Stick on to the path. Just move. Don't try to analyze, bother where you are going, where you are not going. This is most dangerous. Stick on. And the divine will lead us, sometime gently, sometime with a stick. But if we stick on, we are moved. So this is so vast. In fact, in one of the later prayers, mother goes still further. Something which she also notes in one of her earlier works, uh, words of long ago in volume two, that even what seems to go away from the path ends up there. She, she says this in one of her prayers, 
that even they who revolt and turn against thee even they end up touching thy transfiguring love there is something very beautiful it's mentioned in one of the ancient indian fables the birth of the titans and the birth of the gods where lord vishnu has two gatekeepers it's a very difficult and dangerous job to be at the gates of the divine very very dangerous because you cannot afford to make a mistake so but these two are there and their name is jay and vijay victory is with them so but you know over a period of time when you are close to the divine you tend to feel that i am someone very special you forget that whatever you are is because of the grace so these people also start feeling it and one day one of the great sages comes and wants entrance so they ask him his gate pass so he says no i don't have a gate pass he says come on you can't enter lord vishnu is sleeping he says what do you mean just get aside i have a direct entry so he goes the the sage goes inside but before going he curses these two dwarpal that you are full of fear and suspicion full of doubt may you go into worlds of perdition which are full of these doubt and suspicion and fear there is no greater misery than to be in that state so now they are shaken they go to lord vishnu and say we are your servants you have put us under your care you are supposed to protect us do something he says i agree but you must understand that he is a great sage and he is walking in and you speak like this you had done this earlier also you are in the habit of doing it even once you had raised questions about lakshmi you had asked her who are you to seek entrance so i am sorry you know i am very forgiving but sages are sages so you have to go and experience the shrapa the curse but i give you a choice what is the choice says ultimately you will come back to me because nobody can stay far away from me however far they may go separated so yes we want to come back what is the way he says there are two paths one is the path by which you will come back in three lives and one the more better path which will take you seven lives so he says what do you mean three lives and seven lives and you call the seven lives a better path so lord explains he says see if you want to quickly come back then you fight with me oppose me i'll come take you wrestle with you and when you wrestle with me what will be the result annihilation other ways you go love me so over a period of time i will come to you and embrace you whether you get the embrace of the wrestler or the embrace of the divine lover the end result is annihilation of the ego so they ask him but why do you call it a better path the seven lives he says because that is the path of divine fulfillment you don't come back naked in your soul with all your nature stripped off which is useless to manifest the divine so it is true in a way and that's what he says either ways you end up with the embrace of the divine either ways whichever way side we go we end up touching that core the mother says in another prayer thou art so much the essence of everything that there is no one about whom we can say there is no hope because you are the essence of everything the divine is so much the essence he is there in the depths of the darkness so beautifully in who he says when darkness was dense and covered within darkness he was seated within it immense and alone there is no place where he is not there so beautiful so encouraging gives all of us hope but now the human mind can make a one sided theory and say so why not hurl into the abyss this is the problem of the human mind that it's so difficult to make any one sided statements of truth it is true that even when we oppose him we end up uniting with him because there is no other way whatever way we go whichever way we go in one of our prayers she again says thy path is everywhere and yet it is true that there is something called as a path just as the divine is everywhere 
But it is true that there are places which are special and one has to know the difference. In one of her talks, the mother says, again when she speaks of this difficulty of understanding, she says it will be very difficult for human beings to understand the supramental beings because the same things, the meaning, the sense that awakens inside them, the state of consciousness that corresponds to those words is very different from the way it is understood by the human mind. Because human mind is limited by its own set of experiences, whereas as the range of experience widens, the same word carries a very different meaning. And we all know, for instance, one word is knowledge. So often one feels knowledge means to read a lot of books, to be very scholarly, if possible to write books, to advertise about it. The more books you write, the more knowledgeable you are. But Sri Aurobindo says that has nothing to do with knowledge at all. One may have read all that has been said about yoga. One may have all the conceptions of the eternal and yet one may not know him at all. Because in yoga, knowledge means to live in the sense of oneness. Now again, the moment we say oneness, we have a meaning. Oneness means for us everything is same. But that's not what oneness is. But each of these knowledge is awakening to that. Similarly, love. Similarly, wideness. Truth. All these things, as we grow, the meaning changes because it's a state of consciousness that awakens in us. This is the second difficulty. And speaking in that context, the mother goes on. She says, take for example this place, the ashram. Even now, people sometimes wonder about the place. She says, there are people who come here and say, what is special about it? What is spiritual about it? She says, how will they understand? There is here a special condensation of forces. Special vibrations have been brought in play here. One is almost reminded of a story in the Ramayana that when Sita's marriage is going on, so suddenly Brahma says, this marriage, the arrangement has been made by elements which I have not created. How come this thing is taking place? He is amazed because there are new elements in that marriage which Brahma, the creator, has not created. So he is, has to learn that this marriage is not an ordinary marriage. It is the divine and his eternal bride. So new elements have been brought simply for this arrangement which are not there in creation. So something like that, she speaks that there are different vibrations. It is charged by new vibrations. It is charged with the new consciousness. Sri says in one of his letters, it's the place of central influence from where the light radiates at its intensest. And if one does not have that consciousness open and ready, one passes by like any other tourist place. At the end of it, people come out and ask, where is the ashram? That also happens. Of course, Amal Daya has recounted very beautifully when somebody came to ashram and asked him, where are the t-shirts sold here? So people even ask, <laughs> where are the t-shirts sold here? And they come out and ask, where is the ashram? But that's a natural deficiency of the human consciousness that only the like knows like. As we grow, so we begin to understand. And yet, just as that there is a difference, there is a special thing here, which though the divine is everywhere in the world, there is something special one finds here. Just as one can equally say, the divine has always been present in this earth. There is nothing new. This is another problem. People say, why do you speak about divine advent, divine intervention, divine avatar? He is always there. It's true. He is there. He is there more ancient than the ancient roots of our hills. That is how Sri gives one of the meditations. Even when these hills were not there, when the sun was not there, when the stars were no more there in space, when even space and time were not born, he was there. So he is there always. And yet it is true and more true that in certain periods of time, the divine is much more active in his dynamic consciousness than in some other periods. So equally one can say that the supramental path, there is a larger sense 
of the supramental action where it is acting through all the confusion of the world play. It is acting even through things which are apparently contradictory. And it's difficult for us to understand how it is acting, how it is working, because we are so fixed in our human mind to look at the divine in certain fixed ways. It is acting everywhere in all elements because it's a new element that has been introduced. The mother says the very atmosphere of the earth has changed and it is finding instruments which are receptive, brains which can contain this light, hearts which can throb with this love, wills which can naturally align itself, bodies that are plastic to the new consciousness all over the world and wherever there is a readiness, irrespective of anything, our beliefs and non-beliefs do not matter. Wherever there is a receptivity, it is acting. But this is a very general statement. There is at the same time another possibility, a possibility to create a condensation and a concentration of this action. And that's what is the individual and the collective experiment to turn this general supramental yoga going on in the world into a more specific yoga, more suited, something which can lead us through the shortest and swiftest path towards the great realization which anyways is going to come. So in one of the passages, Sri says, what are these two conditions which must come together? Because the supramental realization is not an individual realization. There is nothing like an individual supramental being. Such a being will be a freak very good to admire, but perfectly useless for the earth. So supramental realization by its very nature is a realization where at least a certain number of collectivity, if one may use the modern scientific language, a critical mass, because it's a changeover from one species to another. It is also because the very nature has to change. Nature cannot change in one individual, because there is an interdependence. One cannot say that one individual nature can change. One can superimpose another law on this nature for a time. Yogis have done that in the past. There are yogis who have lived for 200, 300 years simply by superimposing the law of the vital world on the physical. But that's not a change. Change cannot be individual because there is nothing like an individual nature. It's one of those great illusions. One cannot change an individual without a corresponding change in the collectivity. There is such an interdependence. So Sri says, this from the human cycle, therefore, if the spiritual change of which we have been speaking is to be affected, it must unite two conditions which have to be simultaneously satisfied but are most difficult to bring together. There are two conditions and they have to be simultaneously satisfied. There must be the individual and the individuals who are able to see, to develop, to recreate themselves in the image of the spirit and to communicate both their idea and its power to the mass. So this is the first necessity, individuals. Individuals must be ready to receive all that new influx in their body and brain and to be able to let this influx flow into the collectivity around. The second, he says, and there must be at the same time a mass, a society, a communal mind or at the least the constituents of a group body, the possibility of a group soul which is capable of receiving and effectively assimilating, ready to follow and effectively arrive, not compelled by its own inherent deficiencies, its defect of preparation to stop on the way or fall back before the decisive change is made. And then Sri says, such a simultaneity has never yet been affected. And then he says, but one day it will be so. Of course, this is written as we know between 1914 to 1919. And we do believe 
and not just believe, we have that full conviction that after the supramental descent, when the mother started this, the Sri Aurobindo Society and Auroville and the larger action in the world, and of course the ashram began to form much before that, already the certitude was there that it's possible for the individual and the collectivity to come together in such a way that this change can be affected. Because it's not just an individual sadhana. We may like to believe it. That is one of the other illusions that, no, each one has to do his own yoga quietly, peacefully. But it's not an individual yoga at all. It's a collective yoga by its very nature. In fact, the mother would tell us that the very sense of individuality that we carry is itself an illusion. Where is the border of an individuality? Where is the separation? Where can I say that my being stops and another being begins? It's given to us by nature for a certain purpose. But except for even of our physical body, it is not true. If we were to really take a hard scientific look at the physical body, we are constantly affected by the environment which is around, the physical environment, which itself is coterminous and extended through other bodies. That's why when doctors, of course doctors don't do it, they, when they are dealing with patients who are carrying contagious diseases, you know, the old habit of putting a mask, because they know that, you know, the disease can be communicated. There is a space through which it can extend into other bodies. Of course, they can be communicated through other means. Only problem is we don't have masks to wear when we are dealing with serious spiritual and psychologically contagious diseases. But they are also contagious, sometimes more contagious because they are hidden, they are subtle and we don't come to know about it unless we are very conscious. So this is the difficulty Sri again points out in the yoga, in, in the synthesis of yoga. Moreover, the same truth he is telling us, we find that inwardly too, no less than outwardly, we are not alone in the world. The sharp separateness of our ego was no more than a strong imposition and delusion. We speak of delusion, this is a delusion that we believe we are separate. But it's a fact that no man is an island and everything extends into everything else. And that was one reason why for a long time the mother kept the ashram almost like isolated within her womb. Because one had to be very careful that if one gets constantly contaminated with the ordinary consciousness, it is detrimental. In fact, that was one of the problems she was uh, considering about Auroville, that it will have porous borders. There will be a porous zone where it will be extending with the world and there will be an interpenetration. And she says, how to do it? Because it's not easy. The moment there is an interpenetration, there are things which come in and things which go out. So, she's, Shubindu is speaking of this problem. We do not exist in ourselves. We do not really live apart in an inner privacy or solitude. Of course, we can shut ourselves in a room. That's very easy. Our mind is a receiving, developing and modifying machine. Even when we shut ourselves into a room, our mind receives mind currents, mind energies. Into which there is being constantly passed from moment to moment a ceaseless foreign flux. So it's not enough to switch off the TV because this 24 into 7 is all the time active, receiving all the kinds of images, vibrations, thought currents, all the channels are playing and worst because we cannot switch off and change so easily. It's so easy to change the television. So difficult to change this. Much more than half our thoughts and feelings are not our own in the sense that they take form out of ourselves. Of hardly anything can it be said that it is truly original to our nature. And that's why the mother says, which we will probably in subsequent uh, discussions read, she says first thing is to become an individual because unless we develop an individual mold, as long as we remain subject to all the mass forces which come from this side and that side, 
we cannot really become a mold fit for the divine consciousness to manifest. The Aadhar is not ready. So it's very important to have a mold and then she says, then it will be broken. So nature first creates a mold. So we see today's children are really, they are so individualized. This is one of the clear cut changes we can see in today's children vis-a-vis, uh, you know, the past mold. The past mold was social mold. Most people conformed to a type of society in which they lived, they grew up, the milieu to which they belonged. Almost of any individual it could be said, he is this type. But today's children are individuals. They don't conform to anything, neither to the society, nor to the family, nor to the country. They, uh, you know, an Indian child will have suddenly liking for Spanish food and, uh, you know, he will like uh, classical music if there is one in, in, you know, in America, he would like the jazz and rock band there, but he will have Indian sensibilities and he would, uh, you know, love to settle in Japan. So this is the kind of thing that they carry, such a vast consciousness and yet they cut out precise individual modes. But this is one of the problems, he is right now only telling us the problem. A large part comes to us from others or from the environment. So important to in yoga to remember the kind of people we meet and interact with. Whether as raw material or as <laughs> manufactured imports, Shravindo has a tremendous sense of humor everywhere. It's literally stamped and we take it and say, this is mine, this is me. Of course, many times we deliberately do it. We have picked up ideas from here and there and we uh, can write a whole book as if it is our own. But these are nothing but ideas from here and there. But still, more largely, they come from universal nature here or from other worlds. So it's not only this world. Unfortunately, we have to reconcile with other worlds also. And planes and their beings and powers and influences. For we are overtopped and environed by other planes. So this is a difficulty. In ordinary yogas, they also recognize it. So what is the method? The method in, in the ordinary paths of yoga, the method used for dealing with these conflicting materials is direct and simple. You pick up one particular movement and cut off the rest. Or he says, to be alone with oneself or alone with the divine. One says, I don't care about what's happening around. I am realizing the divine inside me. To be alone in, or alone with the divine. To walk apart with God and his devotees. To entrench oneself in the single self-word endeavor of the mind or Godward passion of the heart is the trend of these yogas. So this is a traditional yoga where one lives in a very nice, comfortable, isolated cocoon and is very happy. In ashram we are not allowed, that's why. Invariably, because it's a representative of the world. Even if one wants, it's not possible. One tries to isolate oneself, something will happen or someone will come to make sure we are pulled out. The problem is solved by the accession of all, but the one central difficulty, which pursues the only chosen motive force. But for the sadhaka of the integral yoga, this inner or outer solitude can only be incidents or periods. Accepting life, he has to bear not only his own burden, but a great part of the world's burden too along with it. This is the ancient uh, yogic, uh, the, the, the Vedic uh, understanding of human nature that each one is a representative type. That is how the tradition of Gotras came into play, which now have become very distorted. So when a person belonged to a particular Gotra, it simply meant that a lineage of Rishis who were doing a particular kind of activity. So when one said Bharadwaj Gotra, it didn't mean that one is simply a physical lineage. It meant this Rishi started the ball rolling for a particular kind of work. And each member of that kind has to participate in that collective work. He was a representative. Angiras, Rishi is representative. Janaka, Shurabindas is a representative. He is not an individual. He is representative. So this was the whole idea that every human being is a representative of a larger world. Therefore, his yoga 
has much more of the nature of a battle than others. That's why one wonders why one has believes one has conquered. Ah, today I am free of this problem. I no more crave for sweets. And this lasts only for two days. So this was, there was a real joke of one sadhak telling so many times he used to say, well, I have stopped smoking. So when asked, when, when did you stop? Oh, since yesterday I have stopped smoking. So this is the kind of difficulty. It's a genuine problem of human nature. But this is not only an individual battle. It is a collective war waged over a considerable country. He has not only to conquer in himself the forces of egoistic falsehood and disorder, but to conquer them as representatives of the same adverse and inexhaustible forces in the world. Inexhaustible. That's why the change is slow. It will take time. But when it is achieved, it will be perfect, all encompassing. Nothing would be left out. That is how Mahasaraswati works. Nothing is left out. First the larger lines and then the detailed working. Their representative character gives them a much more obstinate capacity of resistance and almost endless right to recurrence. Often he finds that even after he has won persistently his own personal battle, he has still to win it over and over again in a seemingly interminable war because his inner existence has already been so much enlarged that not only it contains his own being with its well-defined needs and experiences but is in solidarity with the being of others because in himself he contains the universe. We come back to the great ancient truth that within the individual there is the whole universe. The mother says in one of her prayers that each individual element is a world in itself. And then she says, if we allow one element of disorder to remain within us, it's a whole world that will be in disorder. What a perfectionist she is. She goes to that extent of perfection. She says, we cannot cut the knot with some sudden solution. It's a real difficulty because it carries a whole world. And the more the being enlarges and begins to enter from the individual into the cosmic consciousness, the more naturally one begins to, even normally unconsciously, the mother says there is an interchange of forces going on. And every time we meet an individual, we receive and we give. We receive and we give. But as the being begins to enlarge, this receiving and giving becomes much more larger and vaster. And that becomes the special and unique difficulty of this yoga. But at the same time, if one solves this problem, then the problem is solved for the whole world. And that is the kind of task that is given. So, this is the reason for the existence of the collectivity of the ashram and what can be done with a small handful of humanity. Often people feel that, after all, this is a handful of human beings. What can we achieve? We, when we look at the... Many, there are many spiritual movements where, you know, there is a head count, lakhs and millions and sometimes crores and a guru is often measured by the number of disciples he has and by that measure maybe some pop stars and rock stars would be the biggest gurus because nobody can beat the number of disciples they have. But that's not the real issue. That's why Shubhinda says in one of his uh, famous letters, nothing depends on numbers. But this is the condition of the earth. This from one of mother's writings. And it is not very bright. She sees all around there is falsehood, there is disorder, there is confusion. I have spoken about it to you several times already. Even if outside things are deteriorating completely, 
and the catastrophe possibly cannot be avoided. Last time we spoke and several times, Mother is speaking about a possible catastrophe of large masses of humanity collapsing, the vision of the apocalypse, which has been seen in many other uh, uh, civilizations and foreseen by the Mayans, by, uh, by the other great civilizations that around the year 2011, 2011, 2012, uh, great masses of humanity will collapse. So she's saying even if there is a possibility like that, even mother has spoken about something like that. She has not given dates, of course, and she has not given numbers, thankfully. Otherwise, we would manufacture it. She says, there remains for us. I mean those for whom the supramental life is not a vain dream. Who is this us? Those who are convinced about the supramental change. For whom it's not a vain dream. Those who have faith in its reality and the aspiration to realize it. Who is this people who believe that not only it is inevitable, but believe or feel this is the only thing to be done. The mother says this yoga can be done to the end only those who believe that this is the thing worth doing. All other things are really not worth the human effort. So what is left for us? I don't necessarily mean those who have gathered here in Pondicherry, in the ashram, but those who have as a link between them the knowledge Shurabindu has given and the will to live according to that knowledge. This is the criteria of the disciple. That one, there is a knowledge that this is the supramental truth. And second, there is the will to live according to that knowledge. If that will is not there, if there is only the book knowledge, it's not enough. So this twin thing, those who have, there remains for them the possibility of intensifying their aspiration, their will, their effort to gather their energies together and shorten the time for the realization. There remains for them the possibility of working this miracle individually and to an extent collectively of conquering space, duration, the time needed for this realization. It will anyways be. But what we can only do is to shorten the time. There is nothing else which is given to us. Conquering space so that much more of humanity is saved, is moved towards that light. Of conquering time so that the great realization can be nearer than farther. This is given to us. Of replacing time by intensity of effort and going fast enough and far enough in the realization to liberate themselves from the consequences of the present condition of the world, of making such a concentration of force, strength, light, truth, that by this very realization they can be above these consequences and secure against them, enjoy the protection bestowed by the light and truth by purity. This is the only protection and more and more probably the only safety is going to be truth. That's why I think the first word and the last word that one reads when one goes to Sri room and returns is cling to truth. A time probably is coming fast when the only thing that will be the test is truth and nothing else. So she says, this is the great hope of the near future that the tempest may not sweep away this beginning of realization. Instead of falling asleep in an easy quietude and letting things happen, at one place he says one of the big problems that took place after she created the ashram was that the idea was that everything is provided so that we can grow inwardly. But complacency took the place because everything was provided. So human nature very easily falls asleep. So she says, Instead of falling asleep in an easy quietude and letting things happen according to their own rhythm, if one strains to the utmost one's will, ardor, aspiration and springs up into the light, then one can hold one's head higher, one can have in a higher region of consciousness enough room to live, to breathe, 
to grow and develop above the passing cyclone.